And, and then we have um, John Jesus Christ Burroughs, who was back there with his video camera, who's also from Illyria, and he's going to be featuring next month. And John, thank you for doing that. And without further ado, I will bring up Dan Provos from Worcester, Massachusetts. All right. John Rose, who I've known for about five years, a very close friend of mine. Michael Grover, who was on tour with us on the Beards tour, um, who I've known for a while. Alex Nielsen, who is one of the craziest people I've ever met in my life. And uh, he's a very, very close friend of mine. And Casey, I've known him for about four or five years. These guys are close friends, and in this world, you don't meet many people that you can see that close friends. And so I just want to pay acknowledgement to them. You're great people. and. Um, Pay me 20 bucks to say that, so. <laughs> <laughs> we still love you, Dave. That's right. And I, I do intend to read this poem after you're done. So you, you, you still love the hammer. That's right. And some spam. So. All right. Uh, first poem I'm going to read is called The Little Notebook. I carry my little notebook to the park, jotting simple observations, just to prove I can witness, to guess people wrong. Making mistakes about him or her is the most humane event in our psyche. It, bring us, it brings us down to the level of tragic hedonism, twisted and puckered out of forgotten kisses and stares. Yes, yes, I carry this little notebook in my pocket to understand failure, to accept it, but more importantly, to see all the budding traps an occasional man or woman may fall into. Stable territory in my quiet corridor, while hoping someday to return to a place where once my name was known, and my failures were accepted. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about kidney stones, and kidney stones are a proof there is evil in the world. Oh, <laughs> evil. And I was very fortunate because I had a beautiful doctor, and uh, I called her Dr. Fong. And so I <laughs> Dr. Fong. Kidney stones is proof of the evil that exists in the world. So as I laid in a hospital bed and was told I had these awful items inside me, I was ready to click the 22 revolver that was waiting in my holster. The pain was so unbearable that a visit from Hitler would have been a better fate for me. Until this female doctor came in for an examination. <laughs> she gave me a beautiful smile, showing the stones in my body via the x-ray that was taken upon arrival. But the best was yet to come. As I writhed in pain, waiting for her to tell the nurse to get me some morphine, heroin, or just a bullet to end the misery, she dropped her pen, and while bending over to pick it up, I saw the most alluring, sexy, red thong cradling the crack of an ass that Hugh Hefner would die for. My agony, although still present in every movement I made, was now turning into lust for Dr. Thong, the exotic medic at St. Vincent's Hospital. As she explained how the stones would eventually piss themselves out after a couple of days, my Boston Celtics hat fell off my head and onto the floor. <laughs> like a child who was caught with his first dirty magazine, I gave a sly smile and politely asked if she could pick up the lid for me. No problem, was the seductive answer she gave me. And again, showing the erotica shine in the lovely cheeks upon my eyes. Satin buttocks surrounding a flimsy piece of underwear that I was only privy to see. She put the hat on the table and whispered to me, you'll be okay. In the meantime, we'll get something for the pain. <clears throat> little did she know. Little did she know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That what happened last night. Align myself with the dregs of the city last night, walking to Chinese restaurants under the influence of nothing. I feared the reaper. Taken away by the whims of losers, not alone, but inside I'm screaming. Let me be. Let's talk this over. A forget-me-not caught in the drugstore, stolen by some guy who never washes his hands. He is in love with a girl that has all her teeth. I have all my teeth. Many around here do not. Does that make me well-rounded, or just too demure for my own good? <laughs> the thief told me that the girl is HIV negative, and for 30 bucks I could have her for an hour. 
I said, nah, and walked away, dejected and fall. Reach into my pocket and see a due date slip from the library for the movie Titanic. <laughs> it's going to cost me a late fee, but I always loved Kate Winslet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my full-time job is I work in the Graduate School of Assumption College. I'm a college administrator, believe it or not. And believe me, I surprised myself that I'm a college administrator. And uh, one day I was at a meeting and I saw this girl walking outside. I work at Assumption College, like I said. And um, this girl had one arm. So I wrote this poem about her. It was a short poem. Beautiful girl with one arm walking across campus. She approaches the chapel and genuflects. I wonder if she's thanking the Lord for the day or cursing him because of the cruel joke he played on her. She adjusts her sunglasses, does the sign of the cross, and strolls away with a smile on her face. Somewhere, someone must be listening. Thanks. Part of my job also is I have to go to grad fairs and represent the college. And um, I was at Worcester State College, and I saw this girl trying to get a job at this insurance table. And she was very, very timid, and she was just intimidated by all these guys that were getting in front of her. So. I wrote a poem about it. It's called Worcester State Girl at Job Fair. Unsure in her slim, sacred psyche, she waits her turn to approach the hiring insurance company table, twirling the brown straight hair into a band of insecurity. Pink top, long sleeves, gray high rider pants, conservative and by no means trendy. She is willing to let others go ahead of her, obedient to let assured monster suits walk the corporate walk and speak the financial terminology. Falling through the cracks will be the story of this timid creature, waiting no opportunity within quiet pain. Thanks. Uh, I don't know, I'm a, my brother's a musician. Um, in fact, he's backing up the Allman Brothers next month um, in June. And um, I'm a big Government Mule fan. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the band Government Mule. Yeah. yeah, great band. Warren Haynes, guitar player. And um, I wrote this. This was published, um, I think Jack published this. And, uh, Debbie, but it's called Warren Haynes at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. boozy government mule music plays while staggering words dilate in and out of a dream. The guitarists bounce off walls of lonely loveliness as one figure, one man or one woman, sits at a table, pen in hand, praying to the poetry gods for the bewilderment to be over. And off in the distance, where even the devil won't stay, are tales of long limit stairs and showdowns that bleed the souls of thousands who write thank and die beneath each night. The bass player strums. The drummer keeps a solid backbeat. Warren Haynes breaks, breaks into another directed solo. The Babylon Turnpike takes no prisoners. So bold. So bold. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> right, this one, I've never read this one before, but in August I went to a very, very deep place and uh, I tried to hurt myself. I tried to kill myself. And um, which I'm sure we've all thought of, but I took that step. And uh, this was published in the San Diego Verse Quarterly. It's, on, it's the first time I've tried to read it. It's called 4.22 AM, Tripping on K-Pence. 23 Klonopin and a case of beer. Still, I talked to doctors into letting me go home. Five hours later, I was roaming the streets, looking for a new minute toward a battle. I'm a bull guy. Sorry, Kid Rock. You thought of the song, but I was the inspiration. Not even trying to kill myself can stop destination anywhere. I defied death, went into the abyss, and my sleeve was shirt, with no tattoos, with no Samaritans of mercy singing to me. Just an idea, a journey to authors seasoned in hell. I played side slide tricks on Madden Stubrin, but refused to say uncle when the fire got too hot. Motives were never simple when the rain and the wind last seven days and 32 nights. Staggering for thought, apocalyptic lethargy while tripping on K-Pin. <coughs> Staggering through Worcester via Painted Post. Why do I think such thoughts? Knocking out bricks toward eternal love that pangs when I move to the slightest degree to the left. Because I want to be so good in spirit, but the combustible aftershock of a pleasant duration always leads me back to the mire. I'm sick of walking in the muck alone, tired of crisis and despair. A wanted creature of forced defiance. A slave of misdeeds I thought were true. Just a minute in the sphere of existence. We all that stuck. Despite what she thinks, or he thinks, or I think. 
Games are for fools who never live, who never get to live twice. Only one chance at the precious. Never two opportunities. Only one. One time for clarity. Thanks. Chapman, he had something to an uh, unwritten daughter. And this is a poem that um, actually I showed John for the first time. I have one son. And because um, I don't have any kids, and you get to my age and you think, well, I kind of regret it. So I, my own one son. My life will not be with a junior who will take my name and run around in a mishmash of silent dilemmas. No. I had that market cornered, thank you. With senses damaged by dark and events that stay in my domain. I remember once talking to a former lover about a dream I had. We had a son through telepathy, naming him Adelius. Adelius, she chuckled to herself. I like that name. She then asked me why I never had children, which forced me to reveal a broken past about parental wrongs done to me. I could never forgive myself if I made the same mistake, I told her coldly. She could sense the sadness in my heart, realizing I was more scarred than she thought. I'm sorry for all the words she could muster. So, my unborn son, you will never know the experience of being human, facing this world, and seeing how barren and unkempt it can be. It is better for you in the long run, however. There are too many false dignitaries and love long slow deaths upon her. <clears throat> the best thing for you is to never be born, to exist only in my older regrets. Maybe to find other adults more willing and courageous than me that will conceive you within the ideas of love, warmth, and caring. This is the only advice I can ever leave you. The only substantial words I can say. My unborn son. <laughs> Sleeping in the park. Nothing else matters but the clothes on your back and a chance to sense that somewhere someone is enjoying the same sunrise as you. I write these words at a frantic pace so I didn't, do not give myself an opportunity to think. All around me is unified panic. Stairs that foreshadow a blinding rage that builds and builds until murmurs of death become screams from the precipice. Then I slowly dust off the remains of last night's escape and look towards the east. Same sun, same life, different demise. pickup strategy. <laughs> Tell me an obese girl that you would like to go home and swap some fat might not be the phrase I should have used to help me get laid. <laughs> Unless, of course, we're going to get real kinky and make love while bathing in lard. <laughs> ah, thank you. I lived in downtown Worcester and I saw a lot of, you know, strange things in the city and a lot of ODs, a lot of hookers, things like that. So this one's called Looking for a Cure. So I'm sitting on this West, West Park bench waiting for bus 21 and I wonder if the disillusionment I feel radiates all around the teenagers while playing hooky from Doherty High School. They look at me, but since I'm a pretty big guy, they either pass me or stare down at their shoes to save face from the gods of toughness. Another day of hard adolescent prayers were answered. I'm still watching for the bus when a homeless guy who has no pride or morals slinks up to me like a wet rat in the rain and asks if I have a dollar twenty for a ride to Franklin Street. I tell him, yes, I have the money, but it's for me. Thus, you get nothing. <laughs> the man who was wearing a 2004 Red Sox World Championship baseball hat looks at me like I've committed a moral sin because I do not give him a dime. He scatters away, red whip sweatpants and all. And I began to look inside myself and wonder if I'm a whole being or just a poor participant in a passion play of the weary, the rich, and the wannabe Latin kings 
who seem to have a snare painted on youthful, destined to die faces. I think about a song, a sad song by the drive-by truckers, Goddamn Lonely Love. Mm. Now that I am divorced and have absolutely no romantic prospects for the foreseeable future, my heart races with loneliness, even though I am surrounded by thousands of people at a Worcester bus stop. I'm uncertain about others who may be crying on the inside, but I guess the misery that people go through is none of my business. So I exist like a private locksmith with no emotion or care. Just another day of being, facing the flame with lack of concern for anything. A forgotten species, a silent sinner, a favorite puppet. Another bum passes me and asks for 15 cents. I reach into my pocket and give it to him. I walk away gone and not yet cured. The bus arrives. I do not get on. I go back to my hometown, I am reminded by the old locals how much, how much I look like my late father. How my mannerisms, facial expressions, and demeanor are all reflections of a man who never ran away from a fight, jumped out of airplanes while serving in the 82nd Airborne, ran a boxing gym for 35 years, charging no fee for lessons. Yes, I guess it's not so bad to be compared to a sometimes intense, sometimes subtle man. A man of few complications and many overt emotions that he wore on his command sergeant major's sleeve. I look into the crystal of my own life, understand the complexities and agony that are observed with every day by sens sensitivity and anger. Follow the flight of isolation to the nearest obituary of the living, letting it embrace me with its broken crutch and heaving breath. It is one I comprehend his desire for company and in belonging to a brotherhood of heroes compared with my hatred to society's board game that we really don't have a lot of common at all. Thank you. Yeah. This same magazine, this one's called Rootless. Certainly, you never had it. Yours was an excursion filled with ambidextrous on the road episodes and spur of the moment decisions that led to loss of what is deemed sturdy. There were never any solids or routines. Only awakening the plans of emotional proposal and ambiguity towards a spiral that you thought spun out of control when the masses took the train or the bus or drove their Chevy S10s to the mundane. Certainly, you never had it. Only you knew that those who chanted, my God, those who prayed and lived by the golden rule, were doomed to Zoloff and adequacies, erased on Narcissus' looks in the mirror, and cheated on the South Beach <coughs> diet. Certainly, no. As you shared no followers, pretended to no one, felt that the only certainty there is, is a certainty of a parallel universe which you want to observe. Misguided to be suffered or celebrated, zealous to be amused by. Certainty? No. Only hope for the nothing and a prayer for the visceral. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do two more, and then I'm going to get my ass off it, so. What book is that you have there, Dan? Oh, this one is Weathered Woman, which was made by a gentleman named Alex Nielsen. He uh, published it, Ooh. and it's on sale. Um, <laughs> two for ten. On sale. <laughs> <laughs> I've also bought this for beers at the Red Baron Pub, by the way. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so many copies. That's so. excellent. Uh, this is a true story. This is a woman I knew. It's, uh, this one's called Psychotic Slut. So, yeah. fashionably observant and morally confused, she loves the young boys with the passion of a cheap goddess. Her snow small hands scratching nails down a muscular back, white summer dress now thrown on the floor. She will love, then hate, spit and chew until it's time for the senses to appear. Then she will praise this ritual of folly again, with her seduction mask matching the crucifix that dangles between her breasts. 
Damn woman asking me questions, and again, this is from other women as well. Am I real? And if this mass asked while tripping on acid for the ninth time in her life. The internal question, I answered, and then headed toward the church exit. Went home to masturbate and ponder when the phone rang. Am I alive? Mr. Greenwood asked, panting and choking from gas fumes that radiated from her oven. Not much longer, I told her while I cleaned up my mess and then turned out a plasmatic album. Then someone entered my room, a black woman who was dressed in a maid's outfit. Am I free yet? Old Dilsey asked me as I turned down Wendy O. Williams' screams. I don't know, I said. You might have to ask Rita Dub that question. As Dilsey left, I locked my door and turned off the turntable, wondering what other woman were going to ask me questions I had no answer for. I clicked on the TV when a naked Vietnamese girl appeared, running down a street that was cluttered with dead bodies and bullets being fired. To my surprise, she stopped quizzically, stared at me, and asked, will humanity ever come back? I didn't answer at first. Instead, I went to my closet, took out my Colt 45 Colt, put it to my head, and responded, no. Never will humanity come back. I don't know if it even existed. Clang, clang, clang. Thank you. Center. Again, you know, these kids, these four guys are my, some of my best friends of my life, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Strange sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 